the most important piece that everybody misses. Imagine that you took 10 very complex jigsaw puzzles and you threw all the pieces together in one big box. That's how complex the jigsaw puzzle of this world is. The key to understanding this world system is that those who control it, the elite, the bloodlines, all of what you know we're familiar with in general, are trained in esoteric sciences. And in that esoteric science are the structures of systems, geometry, numerology, um, language, all of that. And our entire world system, law, money, everything is based on the esoteric arena. So when you register your property or your child or your home or your car, you are putting it in the registry, which means the property belongs to the king. That includes your body, which is initially registered by the record of vital statistics that we call a birth certificate. That birth certificate creates the franchise that puts you into the United States of America in Washington, D.C and therefore you are owned as chattel property, which means you're movable and you're controlled and controllable. We'll get to that in a minute. We think we're in the land of the free and the home of the brave. It is actually the land of the fee and the home of the slave, okay? We are the most enslaved population on this planet and we think we're free. Okay, and there's nothing more dangerous than a being or an animal or whatever who thinks it is free when it is actually enslaved. What we're really not understanding is that we don't know where we're standing. We don't know where we're starting and we don't know the direction in which we need to go in order to get to where we're going. First of all, to understand the nature of law, money, and history, history is the flow and the evolution of something that I refer to as law to create something that we call money for a specific reason, to basically bind and control the global human population and also at the same time to build our prison planet. And if you haven't noticed, we're in a prison planet. But you have to understand the United States is a corporation through which every other nation on the planet is constructed as a corporation channeled through Washington, D.C., which is the District of Columbia. There is only one corporation on this planet. One corporation. It's called the Crown Corporation. It's in the city of London, which is not London, England. It's a one mile square enclave that is a sovereign city state, which is only one of three on the whole planet. The other two are Vatican City and Washington, DC. It's the tripartite or the triumvirate of power and sovereignty on this planet, okay? Everything descends from that one corporation. How many landowners are on this planet, okay? How many of you own your house? Do you know you're lying? Okay, none of you own your house. Nobody owns land on this planet. There is one landowner and it's the same thing, the Crown Corporation. It's called Unum Sanctum. And for the next 200 or so years, more papal bulls were issued. And the essential element of those papal bulls was to claim that all land and all flesh and all souls belong to it. It is hidden in plain sight because all of law is fundamentally a matter of contract. Contract establishes jurisdiction. And in order to be a valid contract, you have to have several elements. Nothing in history is an accident. It is all purposeful, it is all by design. So, in 1783, this treaty was established and I've highlighted the most important phrase. It's in the beginning. Prince George III, King George III, by the grace of God, King of Britain, France, and Ireland, defender of the faith, Dukes of Brunswick and Lundberg, 
Here's the important part. Arch treasurer and prince elector of the Holy Roman Empire and of the United States of America. Small t. That's a different entity. The prince elector would be the king or the crown and the king controls all the land. And the Pope or the Vatican or the Holy See controls all the law. The law is what binds us as monetary bonded surety, which means we're the guarantor, we're the collateral to all the monetized debt. So there are two lines in history, the line of the king and the line of the priest. Because the Holy Roman Empire owns the United States of America. Do you know you cannot return to the land because you've been lifted off the land? You're in something called the civil body, which is, comes from the Roman Civil Code and it's called the Civitas, which now is referred to as the public. So the United States, the federal government or the federal entity started its life as a bankrupt, as a subsidiary of the United States of America, which is part of the Holy Roman Empire and etc. So what you don't know is we are all under military occupation. The entirety of our judicial and monetary system is designed to maintain the military occupation and something called what became from 1933 on public policy. The provision in 1917 that excluded the U.S. citizen person from being an enemy is now amended to say it is an enemy. So we were defined as an enemy of the state. Okay, but that's U.S. person. What is a U.S. person? It was, it's created as a franchise off of the birth certificate, which is the record that then holds the debtor that creates all the debt during the course of your life. But what you don't understand, this gets into the monetary base of it, is at the bottom of that is an estate. We are all beneficiaries of an estate. When we are born, we are born into an estate. And because we don't have the time, I can't explain how and why, but basically our mothers abandon us, put us as collateral into a trust that becomes the franchise, a vessel in commerce, and we abandon our estate. So we see all these symbols from the obelisk to the pyramid to two pillars, cross, all these symbols, they have specific application and specific meaning. So uh, it's a mass jigsaw puzzle. Religion, by the definition of the word, means to bind again, relig. Ligir is the Latin word that means to bind. So it is all about how do we bind the population of this world to become essentially our slaves. And so religion, broke into many subdivisions. Politics, social structures, economics, legal systems, monetary systems, and so forth. And so the root of that in terms of the symbols is um, if you look at buildings, you look at the uh, Federal Reserve, uh, the, all the buildings in Washington DC and New York, in New York, they have one primary symbol, which is two pillars and an arc. The arc is called a mantle. And so when we talk about anarchy, the word arc designates the source of power. That's why monarch means a monarchy, a singular power. So there are two pillars in an arc, and the esoteric relationship to that is those two pillars represent two lineages. One is the line of the king, the other is the line of the priest. And that is the entirety of how the world is controlled because the priest is how the bondage through legal systems, the law of the priest basically, are contractually bound and binding to all of the world population. And then the line of the king is the king is the singular authority that holds the land. All land is held by the crown. So our world system today has reproduced that. We have the Vatican City, which controls both sides. It is the arc that controls both sides against the middle. The crown that's held in the city of London controls all land, all monetary issue through the banking system. They control the, you know, the London fix through the gold and all of that. They control everything of how the binding nature of the legal system attaches to the creation of what we call money. The law of the priest 
determines the relationship of the binding legal structure to our living substance, our, our body, our life force, our entire output of production from birth until death. There are lineages, there are bloodlines that have always controlled the story. The United States that we know today was formed as a corporation in 1871. So every corporation is a franchise, every LLC, every municipal corporation, every county, every board of education, they're all corporations, they're all franchises, and every single one of them create debt. So for example, if I get a traffic ticket and I'm brought into court and the fine is $300, there are bonds issued in the millions against that $300 debt. So they're hypothecating the franchise, the public circulating monetized debt currency, and they're trading these off book in the millions, trillions, and, and huge amounts. And this is how they've built the entire world system. So to boil down to the essence, we volunteer to be the surety. The franchise is the um, debtor facility through which and by which all of the money as we know it today is created. But if I get called into court and I show up and the bailiff says, okay, I'll rise and is Kenneth Cousins here? And I say, yes, I am. I've just volunteered and allowed them to continue under the presumption of consent. The 13th Amendment established what involuntary servitude was, but it's perfectly legal to have voluntary servitude. And so therefore, everything has to be by voluntary consent. So the voluntary consent comes from the fact that um, from birth and very soon after birth, first of all, the mother volunteers to abandon the baby and register it into the royal trust. So the minute a baby is born, it is registered by the mother and the state considers that the father abandoned the landed estate of this living newborn baby. So the baby becomes chattel property and is registered into the royal estate and we are considered to have abandoned that estate and the executor now becomes the state itself. So the entire system, the United States bureaucracy under the administrative procedures of the bankruptcy that I described and the whole world system because every national entity is also a corporation that's also bankrupt, that's channeled by and through Washington, D.C. to the city of London. It's all one big corporation and one global estate. The key is that we've abandoned our estates. We did not perfect the estate. Well, what is a person? A person is a, uh, what is called a juridical personality, which means a fiction in law. The franchise that I described is a person. So when FATCA comes in and they say all U.S. persons are subject to FATCA, it means they control that franchise. Why? Because it belongs to them. It's their property. Because everything that they're creating in terms of paper, traffic ticket, court case, IRS bill, you name it, is simply another event of monetizing the bankrupt franchise and creating more debt paper to circulate as currency. The system is designed and the parties, the public actors, the judges and so forth are trained to see where there's a flaw. And that flaw gives them a jurisdictional attachment, okay? It's called traversal. We are in martial law in the United States and through the United States Corporation through the rest of the world. That martial law was implemented in the beginning of the Civil War. The Reconstruction Acts established military districts for the 10 southern states. Those southern states never left the military districts, so they have always been under military occupation. Then when um, the 1933 bankruptcy was initiated and the um, Emergency Banking Relief Act was passed, that shifted the whole system into emergency war powers, mili full military occupation. 
That's why the Fed, Federal Reserve System has 10 districts. That's why the world is broken up in districts. They are all military districts. The military occupier is bound by the duties of usufruct, and there are five of those. The first one is it must issue a receipt for everything taken from the occupied territory and people. The birth certificate is that receipt. So it takes all the people and property, puts it under each one of our birth certificates. The United States became the military occupier first of the 10 southern states through five military districts by the Reconstruction Acts. It then created a whole body of military function and occupation. The Federal Reserve Act is part of that. So the Federal Reserve note is nothing more than a mil private military script that we're given permission to use under military occupation. Anything done in the public in commerce is against the law, is illegal, and must be licensed. So that's why we have to get a license to operate in commerce. We have to get a business license, a doctor's license, a contractor's license. All of these are permissions to do something that is technically illegal. If you were to go to a law dictionary, look under the word license, it says permission to do something that's illegal. But if we do anything against their military occupation, then we're considered an enemy of the state. We're considered a belligerent. That's why under the Patriot Act now, we have something called paper terrorism or domestic terrorism because the whole public federal military occupation is called the domestic zone. And so if we do something against their military rules, which is the 60 to 80 million codes and statutes in the United States and millions in Canada and Mexico and everywhere else, then we are doing something that's technically causing harm to the public. We are considered a domestic terrorist. We are a belligerent and we are an enemy combatant. Every nation on the planet is a U.S. person. Okay. It is subject to U.S. law and therefore every citizen in every nation is a U.S. person. They're just not acting on it yet. See, right now we have a, a split system. The public system is where all the debt is. This is where everything that I've described exists. But there's another side, the private. If we are a bankrupt attached as a bonded surety to a franchise, we cannot enter the private. Okay, we've voluntarily given up our right to stand as a private, truly lawful man as opposed to a public citizen. But if we do the, the process that I've described to you, we actually return the person back to the commander in chief under the military occupation and under the rules that he is bound by, by global international treaty, he must maintain that person. And if we do it as a private trust, then we are the true owner as the beneficial interest holder, the equity. And so what we want to do is shift the relationship back to where it's supposed to be. So our status correction process severs the surety relationship, restates the trust, and actually puts the government, the corporation in the trustee position, and we direct the, the corporation slash trustee and all of the sub uh, public actors, judges, clerks of court, IRS officers, they all become trustees under the master corporate structure uh, with the commander in chief at the top. How does one take advantage of this? How does one proceed with this? It's simple. Change your relationship to the debtor bankrupt corporation. It's as simple as that. What I truly know is the only way for us to be a true anarchist. Because the word anarchist means no power, no arc of power above us. Monarch means one power above us. And so an anarchist means between me and all of creation, there is nothing above me, beside me, below me, that has any authority to control or dominate my life or my life force and all of that. And so we teach people how to create their own structure, their own society, and it is fully 
protected by all the way the system is set up. Because everything in the system is based on commercial offer and commercial acceptance. This is how they bind you to their bills and their, their system. In our status correction, we claim and perfect the holding of the equity. And that's what we all want. And one of us can do it, a thousand of us can do it, millions of us can do it. Once more and more of us do it, then we have more capacity to start actually removing the overlay that, that we're all burdened under, whether we're an expat or living in California. <laughs> it's opening up a whole world that you didn't know existed. In the meantime, we have two websites, uh, www on both of them, Pantera, which is spelled with two R's, P-A-N-T-E-R-R-A, P-C-A, which stands for Private Contract Association, dot org. So PanteraPCA.org and Gemstone, just like Ruby, Sapphires, etc. GemstoneUniversity.org. And also we just launched a new YouTube channel under Gemstone University. <coughs> I'm losing my voice. So, <clears throat> so go there. We'll we'll be loading some things. because you know something. What you know you can't explain, but you feel it. You felt it your entire life, that there's something wrong with the world. You don't know what it is, but it's there, like a splinter in your mind, driving you mad. It is this feeling that has brought you to me. Do you know what I'm talking about? you were born into bondage, born into a prison that you cannot smell or taste or touch, a prison for your mind. You've heard today, you've heard throughout the conference a number of different references, allusions to economic structures and, and how important those are in our dealing with the environmental crisis. We're going to talk more explicitly again about that at the 2 o'clock session to kind of help us make the transition to that. Uh, Kenneth Cousins is going to come. Kenneth is particularly concerned with the, the core structures that lead to our social structures that result in the kinds of problems and issues that we're facing. Greetings, everybody. Greetings. My name is Ken Cousins, and briefly, my background is, for the last 25 years, I've been studying fundamentals and the foundation of, as John said, the structure of law and the structure of money, because that permeates everything. When Tina was telling her story yesterday about the lady with the chickens, and she said that, I'm not into politics, this is about chickens. Most people would say, well, I'm not into law, this is about my project, or this or that, the other. But what most people don't understand and don't really take awareness of is that law permeates everything, okay? Uh, just as 
David was talking about uh, concrete and rebar, the thing that holds the concrete together. Law is what holds us all together. So when I started studying law, it reflected on my lifelong study of several subjects, primarily esoteric systems and as well as history. So once I started getting into law, I realized that I had to go back in history. And that's what I refer to as the foundations of law. Law as we have it today is basically the story of history. History is the evolution by purposeful direction of a small group of people to create an underlying structure out of which emerged a system in the last 500 years based on what occurred the previous 5,000 years of what we call money. Okay. Uh, the other day I was talking with, with a couple of people, uh, Scott over there, and he mentioned that coming to this conference is like when he remembered or when he went to a summer session for seven weeks to learn Greek. Okay. Well, what I'm going to do in the next 20 minutes is essentially take a summer session of learning Greek and multiply it by about 10,000. Okay. <laughs> so keeping that in mind, it took me 25 years with a lot of help and a lot of support with associates, partners, strategic alliances, and so forth, to peel off the layers of what I'm going to synopsize in 10, 15 minutes. So this is about, our track is about political collapse. First of all, to understand the nature of law, and money, and history, History is the flow and the evolution of something that I refer to as law to create something that we call money for a specific reason, to basically bind and control the global human population as an asset or a resource that can be de uh, directed to extract the natural resources and add value, intellectual property, property and labor to create value, buildings, farms, everything we take as our modern world. And also at the same time to build our prison planet in order to put that population into that prison and control it just like any other prison with trustees, wardens, rules, restrictions, and all the rest of that. And if you haven't noticed, we're in a prison planet. Okay. In this conference we're talking about seizing an alternative which is great except we don't know our starting point and if you don't know your starting point and in fact if you're starting from a false premise then you have a problem it's what I liken to the to a, an example uh, 30 miles west of here is the Santa Monica Bridge I mean the pier if we were on that pier facing west and we intended to go to New York and we started walking forward, we would be taking a very long trip off of a very short pier, and we would be falling into the ocean, we'd be battered by the waves into the, the pylons and the barnacles, and we would be thrashed and destroyed. Okay, so when we talk about the creation of money and the flow of history and all of that, and where we're at today, and we're talking about seizing an alternative, what we're really not understanding is that we don't know where we're standing. We don't know where we're starting and we don't know the direction in which we need to go in order to get to where we're going. Okay, does that make sense? Sure. So let's begin. Okay, I put this quote up here. It's a Supreme Court where it says US or S dot CT. That means it's a Supreme Court decision. It essentially means it is the highest court statement of reality. It says, the U.S. citizen, citizens of the District of Columbia, residing in one of the states of the Union, are classified as property and franchises of the federal government as a, quote, individual entity. Now, you might say to yourself, but I'm not a citizen of the District of Columbia, and that's where you're wrong. Okay. You may say to yourself, I'm a living being standing on the ground on the land and therefore I'm not a property and I'm not a franchise and I, I may consider myself an individual but you don't understand the definition of the word individual. 
The individual is an artificial construct in the legal system in which we exist. And I'm going to talk about the United States, but you have to understand the United States is a corporation through which every other nation on the planet is constructed as a corporation channeled through Washington, D.C., which is the District of Columbia. So when we talk about franchises and property and artificial corporate constructs in the United States, we're talking about it worldwide. There's only two or three nations that are not corporations or not overlaid by a corporate structure that is not organic in its nature. It is the same mechanistic construct that we've been hearing about all weekend long. So the other, actually last night I was talking to a few other guys uh, who, are, who were planning to come to this talk, and I posed a question to them. How many corporations are there on this planet? And one said 10,000. I said, come on, you don't think it's that low, do you? And the other said 50,000, 100, you know, a million. You know, I kept going like this, 10 million, 50 million, billions and billions. And I said, that's great, except you're wrong. There is only one corporation on this planet. Okay, how many of you knew that before I just said that? You're cheating. <laughs> She's one of my partners. Okay, one corporation. It's called the Crown Corporation. It's in the city of London, which is not London, England. It's a one-mile square enclave that is a sovereign city-state, which is only one of three on the whole planet. The other two are Vatican City and Washington, D.C. It's the tripartite or the triumvirate of power and sovereignty on this planet. Okay. Everything that descends from that one corporation, starting with what were called and what are still called joint stock companies. And the joint stock aspect of it is it's a crown charter. It belongs to the crown which is not the same as the, the man or the woman who sits on the throne, okay? And with those capital investors creating joint stock to access stock, equity, and value or property. Now, I would also suggest to say, how many landowners are on this planet, okay? How many of you own your house? Do you know you're lying? Okay. <laughs> None of you own your house. Nobody owns land on this planet. There is one landowner, and it's the same thing, the Crown Corporation. Okay. Now, that tripartite structure that I mentioned was essentially initiated in the year 1302 by a papal bull, which is a proclamation or a decree by the papacy. It's called Unum Sanctum. And for the next 200 or so years, more papal bulls were issued. And the essential element of those papal bulls was to claim that all land and all flesh and all souls belong to it. Okay? And because we only have 15 minutes more thereabouts, I can't go into the detail. But I can tell you I have 25 years under my belt, and my friend over there has decades herself, and many of us aggregating hundreds and maybe even thousands of years of research. We could show you chapter and verse of where this is laid out. But you think that law is singular and in one place. It is all over the place. So when I said that I've studied esoteric systems, esoteric systems operate on a principle uh, maxim, which is hidden in plain sight. Okay, so law is the same thing. It is hidden in plain sight because all of law is fundamentally a matter of contract. Contract establishes jurisdiction. And in order to be a valid contract, you have to have several elements, full disclosure, meeting of minds, uh, equal consideration, balanced. If I contract with somebody, I give him a chicken or you know, 50 chickens, he gives me a cow, we consider it equal, that's a good contract. Okay, but if his cow has mad cow disease and he doesn't tell me, that's not full disclosure. Well, believe it or not, well, I've come up through the ranks with all the law and the patriot movements, sovereignty movements, and most of them scream about fraud and um, 
non-disclosure and things like that. But what I came to understand in just the last several years is that's not true. It is all fully disclosed. It's there for the finding, but it is fragmented in a sense because it's spread out over time and space in many places. So my work of the last 25 years has been to find those pieces and integrate it into an integrated comprehensive whole that distills it down and saves all of you those 25 years or maybe a lot longer. Because if we don't understand how this all works, we do not understand how we will have the capacity and the standing and the status to do what we're talking about being here, what we want to do. Okay, in terms of standing and status, this talks about that your property owned by the District of Columbia. So how did that happen? Okay, well, from the Unum Sanctum in the early 1300s, there's a, a progression in the historical flow leading up to uh, the founding of the City of London, 1666, which next year will be 350 years. Well, we've heard that number this weekend, 350. Isn't that a coincidence? Well, I'll tell you something. There are no coincidences. And I'm going to give you a quote. Franklin Delano Roosevelt, who basically should know, stated at one point, nothing in history is an accident. It is all purposeful. It is all by design. So when we talk about political collapse here, we're talking about by design. When we're talking about bonded attachment as collateral to a perpetual debt system, which you think is money and property and franchise relationships, then we're talking about how those national corporations were designed to expand to a certain point, creating a monetary system that was uh, insurmountable debt and collapse it. And this has happened over and over through what we would call the flow of civilization. Civilizations, Egypt, Sumer, Babylon, Rome, etc., were all raised up. A monetary system was put in place. That monetary system expanded so that the uh, entrainment of the population and the extraction of resources and wealth could be outpictured and manifested and built and then it was collapsed, and every single collapse was done on a natural mathematical cycle that has been known and perfected over thousands of years. We are at the end point of that natural mathematical cycle. Okay? We are in the inevitability and the absoluteness of the collapse of a debt system. Okay? So if you're talking about what we're talking about this weekend, whether it's a public bank or uh, financing projects or any and all of those things, how can we do it with a debt-based system that is designed to collapse and it's well advanced in its collapse state? We cannot. Okay. So skipping tracks for a moment, going back in history, we think we're in the land of the free and the home of the brave. It is actually the land of the fee and the home of the slave. Okay? We are the most enslaved population on this planet, and we think we're free. Okay? And there's nothing more dangerous than a being or an animal or whatever who thinks it is free when it is actually enslaved. So how did we get here to be enslaved? We think we're in the United States of America. Well, do you know who owns the United States of, the America, of America since the beginning? Give me a moment. Okay, how, how many of you heard of something called the Treaty of Paris? Oh, good. All right, well, this is the Treaty of Paris. It was supposedly the treaty that uh, created the agreement of peace between the King George III and the United States that had uh, supposedly won the Revolutionary War. Okay, how many of you think we won the Revolutionary War? Okay. It depends how you look at it. Militarily, we may have won on a temporary basis, but there's another treaty I'm going to show you in a minute from 1782 called the Treaty of Versailles that established an agreement between the United States, which existed under the Articles of Confederation, that created a perpetual union. The Articles of Confederation established that the name of the Confederation would be capital T, 
which means it's part of the formal name, the United States of America. It was passed in 18, ratified in 1871. It established a body called the United States in Congress Assembled. So in Congress Assembled means that it was the, say, the confederated unified persona of the United States of America, of the Confederacy. It entered into the Treaty of Versailles in 1782 and agreed to 18 million levers of gold that were due to the king, that the payments were starting in 1787, which is when the Constitution was established. So in 1783, this treaty was established, and I've highlighted the most important phrase. It's in the beginning. Prince George III, King George III, by the grace of God, King of Britain, France, and Ireland, defender of the faith, Dukes of Brunswick and Lundberg, Here's the important part. Arch treasurer and prince elector of the Holy Roman Empire and of the United States of America. Small t. That's a different entity. Okay? So you have the arch treasurer, which means the top treasury, the issuer of the money from the city of London at a, of an office called the Office of the Exchequer, right next to something called the Four Inns of Court, which is where the bar associations issue from. BAR stands for British Accredited Registry. Registry, the root is regis, which means it belongs to the crown or the king, but specifically the crown. So when you register your property or your child or your home or your car, you are putting it in the registry, which means the property belongs to the king. That includes your body, which is initially registered by the record of vital statistics that we call a birth certificate. That birth certificate creates the franchise that puts you into the United States of America in Washington, D.C., and therefore you are owned as chattel property, which means you're movable and you're controlled and controllable. We'll get to that in a minute. So Arch Treasurer of the Holy Roman Empire, which was established formally in the year 962 between the Pope and Otto the Great, who was from the Carolinian or the Charlemagnean bloodline. Okay, and they made an agreement to meet at the end of time. The prince elector would be the king or the crown, and the king controls all the land. And the pope or the Vatican or the Holy See controls all the law. The law is what binds us as monetary bonded surety, which means we're the guarantor, we're the collateral to all the monetized debt. So there are two lines in history, the line of the king and the line of the priest. So this was established in 962. It's known as the First Reich. The Second Reich is when uh, Wilhelm Kaiser unified the German states in, eight, in the 1860s. We know what the Third Reich is, but what we don't know is that the United States was always intended to be the Fourth Reich because of this line, because the Holy Roman Empire owns the United States of America. And another thing which we won't have time for me to bring up is in the Constitution, it always refers to the United States, except for two places, and I'll get to the second one in a moment. It's actually the first one. The second one is in Article 2 that describes the president. It says he's the president of the United States of America. That has just been established four years earlier that George III, which means the crown, the crown corporation, is the arch treasurer and the prince elector. The elector is what holds the land. The prince elector is the one that holds the, the titular head of the electoral body. And you can only be an elector if you're on the land. So in our opening um, plenary with the, the elders from the, the Southern California nation, the Tunga, he talked about returning to the land. But do you know you cannot return to the land because you've been lifted off the land? You're in something called the civil body, which is, comes from the Roman civil code, and it's called the civitas, which now is referred to as the public, okay? And so I'll get to that in a moment. But it says the Holy Roman Empire, etc. That's a big word there we don't have time to go into. But nonetheless, and of the United States of America. So this country was founded, owned that, that structure called the United States of America that the president was the president of, was started, owned by the crown. 
So let's look at the word United States, United States in Congress assembled. In the preamble, which is the other place where the United States of America is referenced, it says, we the people of the United States, which is referring to the United States in Congress assembled, representing the perpetual union, et cetera, et cetera, do establish and ordain this constitution for the United States of America. It's a contract with the crown. It established the federal entity that then is also known as the United States, but it's a different United States. Because in the Treaty of Versailles in 1782, that established those 18 million levers that were not paid, so therefore it went into default within months after this was passed, that the United States that's referenced in the Constitution is known as a constitutor. That definition of that word is one who takes on the obligation or debt of another. So the United States, the federal government or the federal entity, started its life as a bankrupt, as a subsidiary of the United States of America, which is part of the Holy Roman Empire, and etc. There's a lot of detail, obviously, I'm, co I'm, I'm going over here, skipping because of the lack of time. The point is that the fiat money system which means disconnected from substance, gold and silver, or a, a parity relationship to value, where one unit of measure equals one unit of value. When you separate that, you go into fiat, you have an exponentially expanding system that the mathematics with the interest will inevitably, within about 65 to 70 years, collapse. Okay, In the United States, or our country, and hence the world, we've gone through three cycles. This was begun in 1789. The first 70-year cycle, which is the, the natural cycle, which is also in international law, the period when bankruptcy can either be settled or renewed. So this country, or this, the United States of America, started as a bankrupt, and in 1859, it had to renew that bankruptcy. And then what happened? Civil War and many things after that. So initially, this United States of America and the United States as the constitutor, because in Article 6, it says, henceforward, all debts and engagements previously valid against the Confederacy, meaning the debts from 1782, are now valid against the United States. But that United States had no assets, so it was insolvent. But it had no collateral either, so the progression was to get the collateral in place. So after 1859, we have the Civil War. What issued after the Civil War is a couple of key things. One is the Civil Rights Movement, I mean, uh, Civil Rights Act. The first one was 1866. And then something called the 14th Amendment, which established that all persons born or naturalized in the United States and subject to the jurisdiction thereof essentially are in that jurisdiction, okay? So what was happening is the first stage of lifting the population off the land to put them into the civil body to become the franchise and the property. The other key thing was that in section four, it says in the 14th amendment that um, the, debt, the debt of the United States can never be valid, validly challenged. Okay, so it's inviolate, including the obligations for pensions and bounty for services in the suppression of insurrection and rebellion. This is a very key point. Why? Because in 1863, something was issued by Lincoln, by one of his um, uh, plenipotentiaries, uh, called Lieber, Franz Lieber, and it's called the Lieber Code. And it's the code by which military occupation will be maintained by a military occupier. Well, guess what? This foreign entity, the United States slash the United States of America, is foreign to the perpetual union and the union of states. From the Civil War onward, it became a military occupier. So what you don't know is we are all under military occupation. Now, the nature of the Lieber Code is that in military occupation, the military must maintain all the public systems and issue what is necessary to maintain that for the civil population. And it can establish rules 
if that population becomes hostile or belligerent. Now we'll fast forward because in 1899 the, uh, a treaty was issued from The Hague defining for the international body, the globe, all the nations, the nature of a belligerent. And today in all the terrorist wars, what do we hear? Belligerents, insurgents, things like that. Because the United States, through its military commercial construct in the Washington, D.C. Uh, city-state, is the military occupier of the planet through the convergence of all the national and bankrupt corporations, then basically our whole planet is under military occupation. It's self-evident. Okay? We can see it as it operates in the world today. The other thing is perpetual war and perpetual emergency. And this is where we're facing backwards because Catherine, in the beginning of the plenary, talked about an author named Klein who is calling for a national emergency. Well, the problem is under a natural, national uh, emergency, all power is vested in the military commander during the occupation. So going back to belligerency and insurgency in the 14th Amendment, the entirety of our judicial and monetary system is designed to maintain the military occupation and something called what became from 1933 on public policy. Public policy is for the maintenance of the collateral, the bonded surety, which is all of us and all the property and all the chattel in this country and on the planet within the construct of public policy. Now hold that thought. I'm going to back up a second. Okay. So 1899, treaty defining belligerency. 1907, another Hague Treaty that reflected the Lieber Code internationally. World War I starts. The United States enters in 1917 and passes an act on October 6 of that year called the Trading with the Enemy Act to define how to trade or operate with enemies who may have uh, trade with the United States that are now enemies. It excluded persons in the United States. But in 1933, when FDR came into um, into office, and he is uh, lauded as, as one of the great presidents of our country. Well, on the one hand, he did a lot of good things, okay? But it was all systematic, and he's the one that I quoted, that he said nothing in history happens by accident. So that expansion and collapse, remember that 70-year period. The last one was 1859, it ended. What's the next date? 1929. Purposeful collapse because it went from 1859 and what preceded uh, or what followed after that in which the land was collateralized to the debt. And then in 1929, the persons were collateralized to the debt. The property, the franchises, the individual entities that I started with. And so in 1933, when he took office, he proclaimed a national emergency. And in the Trading with the Enemy Act, there's a phrase that was activated on the date, March 9th, 1933, three days after he took office, in something that was issued called the Emergency Banking Relief Act. The very beginning of that says that the provision in 1917 that excluded the U.S. citizen person from being an enemy is now amended to say it is an enemy. So we were defined as an enemy of the state. Okay, but that's U.S. person. What is a U.S. person? It was, it's created as a franchise off of the birth certificate, which is the record that then holds the debtor that creates all the debt during the course of your life. But what you don't understand, this gets into the monetary base of it, is at the bottom of that is an estate. Now let's go back to 1666. After the city of London, after the great fire of 1665, a year later, the city of London began to be built. There was an act passed called the Sesta KV Act. Sesta KV means a number of things. We could take it literally from the French and the Latin. It's Setu KV. You are that which lives. You are the life. It is who we are as living beings. But also, it means the beneficiary of what? An estate. We are all beneficiaries of an estate. When we are born, we are born into an estate. And because we don't have the time, I can't explain how and why. But basically, our mothers abandon us 
put us as collateral into a trust that becomes the franchise, a vessel in commerce, and we abandon our estate. Okay, we do not perfect our estate. And without, obviously, the time to go into how this is, it'll take you, if you wish to proceed to learn this, at least six months, if not a year or longer. But the bottom line is that when that estate is created and the franchise is created on top of it, the underlying value that is created is in that estate. The debt is like a secured, bonded, uh, uh, bonded we, we as the living beings are the bonded surety. That means we guarantee it. The franchise itself is the debtor. So from the birth certificate, I know I'm out of time, but if you can stick with me for about 10 minutes, I'm going to tell you something that you really need to, to hear. Anybody needs to go, please do go. Um, so all the debt that's created by the entire Federal Reserve System is bonded, securitized debt of the franchise. It is underwritten by the value of the estate. We have the capacity to claim that estate, and that's what our work is about, among other things. Okay. Um, obviously, for the, the issue of time, I can't get into all that detail, but this is examples of all the pieces that are the building blocks of the legal monetary system over hundreds and really thousands of years. So back to the 1933, the Emergency Banking Relief Act, that was a declaration of emergency. And as it amended the Trading with the Enemy Act, it gave the president singular authority pre-approved. If you read the beginning of that act, it says Congress pre-approves, according to the Trading with the Enemy Act, everything the president says. That's why executive orders have the power that they do, because it's a military construction of a occupied um, conquered territory and people, which we are, and the whole world, because once the Bretton Woods system was put in place, all the Federal Reserves, be the Federal Reserve notes became the reserve currency of all the central banks. Every central bank in that national corporation that I reference is how all those populations are bonded. So that was a fixed rate of exchange. In 1971, that fixed rate of exchange was removed by Nixon, and then we got the petrodollar, which made a, a parallel relationship between the expansion of the consumption of energy equal to the expansion of the Federal Reserve note base of the world currency system. So we were consuming our own demise by what our consumer society operated under. That too has a lot of detail and so forth. So. I'm going to cut all of that short ending here because of the time constraint. Hey, everybody. Welcome to another edition of Anarchast, your home for anarchy on the Internet. I have a really interesting guest coming in from California. Uh, you might have been hearing a lot of things. Uh, I've heard this for over the years. A lot of people saying things like your real name is capitalized and your not real name is not capitalized. And you're, you're actually owned and your birth certificate is uh, actually part of you're part of a corporation and the U.S. is part of a corporation. This is something I've actually never really looked into. Uh, but our next guest is a, is a, a total expert on he's actually spent 25 years looking into all these things very deeply to the point where he's actually started up his own private society called Pantera and he actually has his own university called Gemstone University where he teaches people how they become enslaved through this entire system and how the entire system works and most interestingly to our audience is how to actually remove yourself from this system uh, as well his name's Kenneth Scott and as well he'll be coming to Anarchapoco he's a sponsor of Anarchapoco and so he'll be there so if you have any questions you want to ask him about uh, how to deslave yourselves, how to remove yourself from the system. Uh, he apparently uh, has uh, information on how to do that. And we're going to hear all about what this is all about, because a lot of this is very new to me. Uh, but I've heard it a lot. And actually, a lot of people uh, who have been registering for Narcopoco, they put their name and then they say house of something. And I was like, oh, this is, must be some weird little new kind of cool thing that kids are doing or something. But this is all kind of related to what Ken is talking about. So we're going to get into all of that with Kenneth Scott in just a moment. But before we begin, though, Kenneth, I have to ask you, how did you become an anarchist? <laughs> uh, good question, Jeff. Thanks. Thanks for having me. Uh, I have to really say that I became one because I was born as one. Uh, I've had this passion since a very early age. Uh, literally, when I was three, four, five years old, 
I had a sense that something was distinctly wrong in the world that I was born into. And at an early age, uh, I had several passions. One was a passion to learn everything about everything. Secondly, was a passion to learn it so that I could figure out a solution why or with what I learned, how we could do something different. Ultimately, as I grew up and then I entered into my research, as you mentioned, for the last 25 years, I came to understand the exact nature of how we are in bondage. And with that, I came to understand what I truly know is the only way for us to be a true anarchist. Because the word anarchist means no power, no arc of power above us. Monarch means one power above us. And so an anarchist means between me and all of creation, there is nothing above me, beside me, below me that has any authority to control or dominate my life or my life force and all of that. So truly, I've been an anarchist my entire life because I believe in absolute freedom, not partial freedom, absolute freedom. Me too. And uh, of course, I've been talking about this for years and uh, and talking about all the different angles on anarchy and stuff like that. But I've never gotten into I, I've seen it all over the place. I see people talking about it all the time about how your birth certificate is actually your own by the the uh, corporation of the U.S. And that corporation is part of another court. It's, it's very confusing to me and I've never really looked into it. So we've got you here to explain it all to us. So what is this? How what is this entire system we've somehow been uh, trapped into. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, let me start with this. <clears throat> did, you ever, did you ever do jigsaw puzzles in your life? Yep. Okay. <clears throat> you know how a jigsaw puzzle, you have to study the whole picture. They give you the picture on the cover. But to really get down to the depths of how to put it together is like three, four, five different layers. There's the shapes of the pieces, there's the color nuances, there's the image, there's all kinds of things that you have to correlate. And our brains are very well um, capable of seeing the multidimensionality of something. Now, imagine that you took 10 very complex jigsaw puzzles and you threw all the pieces together in one big box. That's how complex the jigsaw puzzle of this world is. So one of the areas that I've focused on in my studies for literally almost my entire life is esoteric uh, metaphysical concepts. The key to understanding this world system is that those who control it, the elite, the bloodlines, all of what you know we're familiar with in general, are trained in esoteric sciences. And in that esoteric science are the structures of systems, geometry, numerology, um, language, all of that. And our entire world system, law, money, everything is based on the esoteric arena. So when I say we take a big box of multiple uh, jigsaw puzzles, the esoteric science gives somebody the ability to see these multi-dimensions. Because one of the, the key maxims when you're trained in esoteric science is everything is hidden in plain sight. Okay, so we see all these symbols from the obelisk to the pyramid to two pillars, cross, all these symbols they have specific application and specific meaning. So uh, it's a mass jigsaw puzzle. One must understand all of that and see it. And that's what's meant by having eyes to see in order to see the reality of the system and the world that, that we're in. That's the key to the code of the matrix. So where does this all begin? Uh, so you're saying that this is all sort of a structure that's been put in place for hundreds of years uh, and of that years. Uh, hardly anyone. Yeah. And hardly anyone, myself included, knows anything about it. Um, so where did this all begin and who who designed all this? And what, what's going on? What's the story? <laughs> OK, good question. Uh, it really goes back to Egypt. And I'm sure well before that, but for our purposes, we could say Egypt five to 6,000 years ago. Through Egypt and Sumer and Babylon, Babylon, I'm sure you've heard of reference to the money system as a Babylonian debt magic system. 
Okay, there's specifics to that. And literally this has been hardwired in everything of the last 5,000 years. Ultimately, all the way back then, there was only one system. It was basically what we would, for lack of a better word, call religion, okay? Religion, by the definition of the word, means to bind again, relig. Ligir is the Latin word that means to bind. So it is all about how do we bind the population of this world to become essentially our slaves. And so religion broke into many subdivisions, politics, social structures, economics, legal systems, monetary systems, and so forth. But it all does get back to that root point. And in the root, in the esoteric understanding of Egyptian, Sumerian, Babylonian systems, which Rome certainly implemented because it's one continuum ever since then. There's never been any, you know, oh, it's a new empire, it's a new system. No, it's always been one system. And so the root of that in terms of the symbols is um, if you look at buildings, you look at the uh, Federal Reserve, uh, the, all the buildings in Washington, D.C. and New York, in New York, they have one primary symbol, which is two pillars and an arc. The arc is called a mantle. And so when we talk about anarchy, the word arc designates the source of power. That's why monarch means a monarchy, a singular power. So there are two pillars in an arc, and the esoteric relationship to that is those two pillars represent two lineages. One is the line of the king, the other is the line of the priest. And that is the entirety of how the world is controlled because the priest is how the bondage through legal systems, the law of the priest basically, are contractually bound and binding to all of the world population. And then the line of the king is the king is the singular authority that holds the land. All land is held by the crown. So our world system today has reproduced that. We have the Vatican City, which controls both sides. It is the arc that controls both sides against the middle. The crown that's held in the city of London controls all land all monetary issue through the banking system. They control the, you know, the London fix through the gold and all of that. They control everything of how the binding nature of the legal system attaches to the creation of what we call money. The law of the priest determines the relationship of the binding legal structure to our living substance, our, our body, our life force, our entire output of production from birth until death. And so, without going into detail, because we don't have time here, but this is what we teach in Gemstone University, the, the fundamentals is understanding how we have been lifted off the land and put into a containment field. That containment field is the binding nature of the money system through and by the legal system as essentially a globally expressed law of the priest. And we have many priesthoods, but, you know, we could say the medical priesthood, the financial priesthood, the, the religious priesthood, but it's all set up as a religious uh, ecclesiastical world system that binds us to the, to the law of the priest. And when we are bound to that law, we are beholden and controlled by that law. And that's the key. So we can get into that a little bit more as we go along. So who is it that is designing all this system and how has it stayed in place for thousands of years without hardly anyone knowing about it? That's a good question. <laughs> um, well, you've heard of, you mentioned earlier and, and before we started recording, you asked about, you know, calling my name, Kenneth Scott of the House of Cousins and you've heard other people do that. Well, what do we know about houses? We've got the house of Rothschild, the house of Windsor, we've got the house of many, many nations. I mean, not nations, but uh, private, private families. That is counterposed or separated from how the world population is put into the containment field that I've mentioned. So those houses go back literally thousands of years. Uh, and 
you know, if you look at the Bible and you take away the religious overlay, you can actually see the layers of the system of how commerce is constructed, how the binding nature of, of what I've talked about is constructed. And that, that document, that book, was based on previous structures, again, going all the way back to, to Egypt. And, you know, to answer your question, there are lineages, there are bloodlines that have always controlled the story. They put that story into religious terms, they put it into secular terms. Today, the movies are the purveyor of the story. And if you know how to look at it, you can see all of this running through. It's literally when, when Neo woke up in the movie, The Matrix, and he could see the, the flowing of the code, nothing could touch him. Remember at the end of the first movie, the agents try to attack him, but he was now in control of the code of The Matrix. The code of the matrix is the legal system, the monetary system, the religious system, all of the nature of, of what we're talking about, how we are bound and bonded as what I said earlier before we started recording, which we should get into in, this, uh, in the interview, is our real status is we are a bonded surety to a bankrupt franchise. And so we have to define what that really means. Please do. <laughs> okay. Uh, remember I said religion is to bind again. Okay. First of all, you understand what a bond is, correct? More or less, yes. Okay. Well, a corporation issues a bond. It has mm -hmm. assets. It can bond its assets and issue that bond as a instrument of debt. Correct? Right. Okay. So that's a bond. Somebody has to underwrite that bond, which is the nature of insurance, the, innate, the nature of secured interest and security um, when a security such as a bond is issued by a corporation. So underlying that, that underwriter is some base of, of value that assures the, the delivery of the, um, what's being insured should there be a default. So a corporation can issue bonds. Um, it should technically issue them up to the level of its available um, unencumbered assets. Of course, we know they issue them <laughs> uh, way in excess of that. But that describes basically um, a bonded surety. What is the collateral that assures the, the, the value that's issued or bonded or securitized with that instrument? So I said a bankrupt franchise. What does that mean? Well, we know that every country in the world has a central bank. Virtually, there's a few that aren't. That central bank is a bank of issue. And what does it issue? It issues a money system that is monetized debt. How is that debt underwritten? It's underwritten because each debtor is a subdivision of that master corporation called the United States or Canada or Mexico or whatever that nation is, which tells you that every nation in this world is actually a corporation. And so the central bank can wrap, just like a corporation wraps its assets and issue bonded debt that's going to circulate as currency. So we essentially have volunteered to be the bonded surety to the franchise that is a corporate, the subdivision of a corporation that is issuing monetized debt, which we call money, Federal Reserve notes, Canadian dollars, whatever the case may be. So that requires us to describe or, or define how did these corporations get into bankruptcy? That's a very long story, so I'm going to shut it down. Uh, uh, boil it down to a very succinct statement. The United States that we know today was formed as a corporation in 1871. There were previous corporations created. And in fact, the United States as we know it today started its life in 1789 as a bankrupt and has continued to be put through reorganization over the last 220, 30 years. So that 1871 corporation began to expand its corporate business 
It took upon itself bonded liabilities through the Federal Reserve Act in 1913, and by 1933, it was bankrupt. So it had to be reorganized. This is what FDR called the New Deal. And when FDR came into office, within three days, an act was passed by Congress called the Emergency Banking Relief Act. And that act gave the executive complete authority to operate under emergency rules and essentially what's called war powers, which goes back to Lincoln and the Civil War. So that's the United States being bankrupt, which it has been ever since March 9th of 1933. In the reorganization, it was given the ability to how to administer and, and run the debtor in possession of the United States and how to remonetize it. The way it remonetized it, it brought all the persons and all the property of the entire body under its authority and started bonding it through the mechanism that I described. The way that was done was the issuing of franchises. So every corporation is a franchise, every LLC, every municipal corporation, every county, every board of education, they're all corporations. They're all franchises and every single one of them create debt. Every instrument that's ever issued in those franchises. So we'll take my name. The franchise is in all capital letters. Those that franchise is considered a vessel in commerce and a debtor facility through which and by which monetized debt can be issued. Every time a contract or a bill or anything is issued in the name of that franchise, it is a monetary instrument. Underlying that is also many layers of derivative bonds. So for example, if I get a traffic ticket and I'm brought into court and the fine is $300, there are bonds issued in the millions against that $300 debt. So they're hypothecating the franchise the public circulating monetized debt currency, and they're trading these off book in the millions, trillions, and in huge amounts. And this is how they've built the entire world system. So to boil down to the essence, we volunteer to be the surety. The franchise is the um, debtor facility through which and by which all of the money as we know it today is created. That's interesting that we volunteered. I always found the old uh, vampire movies and things like that where they can't come into your house unless you invite them in. I've always found there was something more to that than just a funny story or interesting story. Right. So how did we volunteer for this unwittingly? <laughs> See, what you just described is a fulfillment of, of what I said earlier, that primary maxim in the esoteric arena, which is hidden in plain sight. Remember the, the 10 jigsaw puzzles all mixed together? It's all hidden in plain sight. And technically, see in law for a contract to be valid, there must be a full disclosure, full meeting of the minds. So the way they justify it is, well, there is full disclosure, nothing is hidden. It's hidden in plain sight because it's fragmented like the pieces of those jigsaw puzzles that are all jumbled together from the untrained eye. But the trained eye knows how to see, like I've mentioned uh, an act, the, the Emergency Banking Relief Act. Well, that ties into another act called the Trading with the Enemy Act of 1917. It ties into the 14th Amendment of 1868. It ties into other things, literally hundreds and thousands of years old. They're all tied together and they all create one unified system of, of law and legal structure. So it's not hidden. And so they justify it by saying, you had the ability to see all of this, to know it because we've disclosed it all. We disclose it everywhere. We put it in the movies. We tell you what we're doing. We're telling you what we're going to do. And so you have the ability to properly and timely object to the presumption of consent because see that's how it works so i'm not the franchise i'm the bonded surety to the franchise but if i get called into court and i show up and the bailiff says okay i'll rise and 
is Kenneth Cousins here? And I say, yes, I am. I've just volunteered and allowed them to continue under the presumption of consent. It goes all the way back to birth. And, but see, uh, well, first, let me say that this, a lot of this was put in place in the Civil War and right after the Civil War. The 13th Amendment established what involuntary servitude was, but it's perfectly legal to have voluntary servitude. And so therefore, everything has to be by voluntary consent. And let me skip a track and, and go to another puzzle piece. Um, have you ever heard the phrase indentured servant? Of course. Okay. Well, what that refers to is if I'm a grantor of a trust and a trust has three parties, it's a triangle. You have the grantor who grants a item or many items of value that's called the corpus and the in initial grant. Then there's a trustee who has legal title and controls the, the legal aspect of that property. Then there's a beneficiary who has equitable title. This is what's called split title. If there is a split title trust, then you do not own anything in absolute title. And everything in our system is based on trust. Every time they create something, every time we agree to participate, we are creating new trusts. Every time we go into court, a new trust is created. Okay, everywhere. There are billions and trillions of trusts. And so, if a, let's say I'm on a dock in, in England in the 1700s and I want to come to America, but I don't have any money. But what do I have? I have the value of my labor. But I have to hypothecate that labor into the future. Okay, you, I know you're quite familiar with hypothecation and taking value and trading off of it. Well, the basis of that is hypothecating something that I own today and I you know, project it into the future, and I am giving a, a monetized value today. So in that instance, I'm on the dock, the only thing I have of value is my labor, but I have to do that over a period of time. Therefore, I will indenture, which means to bond myself into a trust relationship, and I become an indentured servant. That's a voluntary servitude. So I will say to the captain of the ship, if you give me passage to America, I will bind or bond my labor for the next five years and I will work for you and I'll work it off. That's called an indentured servant. We've just created a trust. I'm the beneficiary of it because when it's over, I get to be free. I get to be uh, the possessor of the right to, to exist in America and I will pay for my passage to the ship and the ship owner. He is the legal trustee because he holds the indenture of the corpus or the body of the trust, which is actually my body because I have apothecated my labor. This is the essence of how the whole system works. So the voluntary consent comes from the fact that um, from birth and very soon after birth, first of all, the mother volunteers to abandon the baby and register it into the royal trust. So remember I said the, the, um, the crown holds all the property, all the land, going back to the city of London. Well, our physical bodies are considered a landed estate. So when we register it, the word register is, de is derived from regis, which means royal or regal. Uh, the term real estate actually means the royal estate. Real in Spanish, you know this, means the royal, like El Camino Real, means the royal highway. So real estate is really the royal estate. That's because the crown, as the royal estate, holds all title to all of, of what's pledged or registered into it. So the minute a baby is born, it is registered by the mother and the state considers that the father abandoned the landed estate of this living newborn baby. And we don't have time to get into it in, the, in this interview, but underlying trust law is estate law. And estates have been structured over hundreds and hundreds of years in a manner to, today in the world system, everything in terms of property is in an estate. It's either um, 
uh, non-portable property, which is in the royal estate as real estate, or it's chattel property. So the baby becomes chattel property and is registered into the royal estate. And we are considered to have abandoned that estate. And the executor now becomes the state itself. So the entire system, the United States bureaucracy under the administrative procedures of the bankruptcy that I described, and the whole world system, because every national entity is also a corporation that's also bankrupt, that's channeled by and through Washington, D.C. to the city of London. It's all one big corporation and one global estate. The key is that we've abandoned our estates. We did not perfect the estate. And so what we teach, because we've perfected the knowledge of how to do this, is how to correct our status. This is what Pantera as a private society is about. This is what the Gemstone University um, both teaches the detail of what I've described. And we've developed a course called Status Correction. It took us four years already to build this entire course. And it walks our members through every aspect of disconnecting the contractual nexus to being the bonded surety to what I've been describing. It's uh, very interesting. Uh, so if someone were to do something like that and to go through the process to disconnect from the system, uh, what would that mean? What would that, how would that change their life? Well, okay, let me go back to trust law, what I described as the split title. Remember I said that the legal title is held by the trustee. The beneficiary holds the equity. And you understand that, you know, and um, well, let me back up a step and say we talked about a corporation issuing bonds, but it also can issue stocks. Stocks are what? They're equity in the net value assets of the corporation. Those net, that net value is determined by reducing its external obligations, which includes all of its bonds, correct? So in a trust, you have legal title and you have equitable title. <clears throat> the true owner of a, of a true exclusive equity trust, and there's a reason I use that phrase, is the beneficiary. And the legal title holder, meaning the trustee, is actually the liable party, okay? The trustee has all the debt obligations. It is liable for all of its, all of its pledged uh, collateral and, and um, obligations, claims, contingent claims, all of that. Why? Because it has legal title to the trust corpus. And so um, right now, the way things are supposed to be is the governments of the world are supposed to act as trustees. They're supposed to hold things in trust and take care of the liabilities uh, based on the, the legal title that they hold for the benefit of the equitable interest uh, beneficiary. But what they've done is they've turned things around. So remember when I said that if I walked into the court and the judge says, are you Kenneth Cousins? And I say, yes, well, I have not only volunteered to and consented to their construction, I've also stated by that act that I am the trustee which means I'm the liable, I'm holding the liability. I have all the debt. I have all of the obligation for the claims, contingent claims and perfected liabilities against the body or corpus of the value of the trust. And so what we want to do is shift the relationship back to where it's supposed to be. So our status correction process severs the surety relationship restates the trust and actually puts the government, the corporation in the trustee position and we direct the, the corporation slash trustee and all of the sub uh, public actors, judges, clerks of court, IRS officers, they all become trustees under the master corporate structure uh, with the commander in chief at the top. So, Many people ask, well, if I disconnect from this franchise, how am I going to do business? You know, I like anarchy, but I also like capitalism. I want to create value. I want to have that value. I want to control it. So I'm sure you've heard the phrase, own nothing, control everything, right? 
Yeah, wasn't that the Rothschilds? Yeah, well, Rockefellers, Rothschilds. One of the one of them. <laughs> and the secret to that is an integrated, multi-layered strategy in which all of the ownership of the value and the assets is structured between a trust estate um, structure and the extensions of that, which can be international corporations or other types of entities. The key is that knowing how to structure that, you can own nothing technically because we don't want to own anything in this current system. If we own it, that means we're the legal title holder. That means we have all the liability. I'd rather have the United States Corporation hold the liability and I, as the director, the controller of that, as the beneficial equity holder, be able to direct the trustee and say, you pay this, you pay that, you take care of all of that. And that's actually where we've arrived at in our status correction process. We're right at the point where we are compelling the trustee, whether it's a court officer, an IRS officer, or everything, a bank officer, that they hold the legal title, but they're required under that to take care of the, um, the liabilities. And we can hold the beneficial interest in a way where we control it all and have none of the liability. So if you went and did something like this, you would, uh, once you'd gone through this process, you would have all your assets in a, some sort of other structure that you don't actually own, you just control somehow through what you do. Um, but does this actually, like for things like taxes and stuff like that, are you saying that if you went through this and you disconnected from this system that you don't have to pay taxes anymore and things like that? Is that what you're saying? Well, let me redefine it with a, uh, a quote from the IRS code. The IRS code is based on one principle, a person liable to pay. You ever heard that phrase? Yep. <laughs> okay. Um, <laughs> And I have to tell you that I started, as I said, 25 years ago. My first beginning in studying law was the IRS code. And I've had some friends who have read all 11,000 pages of the code several times through and are absolute experts. And I've studied with them and, and have understood it through that study. But it boils down to that, a person liable to pay. Well, what is a person? A person is a, uh, what is called a juridical personality, which means a fiction in law. The franchise that I described is a person. So when FATCA comes in and they say all U.S. persons are subject to FATCA, it means they control that franchise. Why? Because it belongs to them. It's their property. That's the person liable to pay. But if we're the surety, bonded surety, that has volunteered to hold the liability, then we become one and equal with that person liable to pay, and hence we must pay it. But if we turn it around in the way that I briefly described, and we restate that franchise as a private trust, and we establish the public system as the trustee under the commander in chief, which brings in a whole other element, which is the military martial law under which we are all in the United States and in the world under right now, um, then they really, um, as I've described, they're the trustee, they hold the liability because they hold the person. They created it, we actually return it to them. See, a lot of people in the law movement and the freedom movement and everything say, well, we want to collapse the trust. We want to destroy the relationship to the social security. And I say, no, I want to perfect it. I want to claim it. When I perfect it, I claim it and I claim the equity behind it. See, right now we have a, a split system. The public system is where all the debt is. This is where everything that I've described exists. But there's another side, the private. If we are a bankrupt attached as a bonded surety to a franchise, we cannot enter the private, okay? We've voluntarily given up our right to stand as a private, truly lawful man, as opposed to a public citizen. But if we do the, the process that I've described to you, we actually return the person back to the commander in chief under the military occupation and under the rules that he is bound by, by global international treaty, 
he must maintain that person. And if we do it as a private trust, then we are the true owner as the beneficial interest holder, the equity. And if I were to say to you, here's a corporation, it's got lots of, lots of assets and lots of debt. Which would you rather have? Would you rather be liable for the debt or would you be li like to hold the equity as the assets? I choose the assets. Oh, very good. You passed <laughs> the first test. <laughs> um, that's what we want, not only individually, but collectively. Okay. And so that's, you know, this is, it's more detailed as we get deeper into it. And, um, but that goes back to the answer of your question. How does one take advantage of this? How does one proceed with this? It's simple. Change your relationship to the debtor bankrupt corporation. It's as simple as that. And uh, you help people to understand how to do that through both Pantera and Gemstone, correct? Correct. Yeah. And, the and other thing, do you have any examples of people who have done these things and been successful in removing themselves from the system? Well, the last time I filed a tax return was 1988. I have corresponded with the IRS many ways and many times through the last, what is it, 28, 29 years. Um, uh, the Pantera Society is structured and defined as an ecclesiastical body, which people would say, well, that sounds like a religion. And it's not. You have to go back to the roots of words. Ecclesiastical comes from the Greek ecclesia, which simply means the body of the congregation. We are living bodies. We can come together with um, a group of people and we create a congregation of multiple bodies as an ecclesia. The entire world system is based, like I said before, on religion. Okay. The United States is actually a religious body. Every city is a religious body. It's all based on ecclesiastical law. And so we are just reproducing it. And so as a private society with an ecclesiastical structure that they cannot refute because that's what the system is. We just know how to claim it and perfect it. So we've created a court. It's an ecclesiastical court, which jurisdictionally is superior to every court in this country. Okay. And they know it. So our court is a court of record. We hold the records of everything we do. We've recorded it, we've archived it, and we notice. We've noticed, um, we have a website, PanteraPCA.org. It has all of the public notices that we've sent. We've sent it to the Holy See, to the Vatican, the Lord Mayor of the um, City of London, to the President, to the uh, Ban Ki-moon at the UN. We gave them notice four years ago. This is who we are. If you have any basis in law to refute, reject, or deny this fact, you have a time to properly do so. They never have. Therefore, when I communicate to the IRS, to courts, I tell them that I'm the Chief Justice of the Court of the Ecclesia of the Pantera de Oro Private Society. And do you know what? When they write back, they write exactly how I tell them to do so. Okay. I tell them that I'm not in the zip code system because that's the corporate system that is part of the binding contract that puts us in that system. And I've got IRS, a state court, federal court, many entities in their system that have acknowledged by writing to me as exactly what I say I am. And so um, we also you know, we have two uh, premium courses that we, we teach people. One is a status correction. The other is how to create your own society and reproduce what, um, uh, what I've described Pantera is. My goal when I set out to do this was to create a replicatable model that is infinitely replicatable. And so we teach people how to create their own structure, their own society, and it is fully protected by all the way the system is set up. And so, yeah, to answer your question, uh, I haven't filed a tax return in 27 years. Uh, in fact, in recent times, the 
the IRS came knocking on my door for something that went back on a, you know, I don't need to go into the detail, but a, a mechanism in which they created a tax liability on my franchise. And I didn't know it was there for a while. I, I then became aware of it. I did certain paperwork that I sent to um, the IRS in Puerto Rico, which is actually the home of the IRS. And then another IRS officer decided to try to remonetize the franchise. And so he came and he made an offer because everything in the system is based on commercial offer and commercial acceptance. This is how they bind you to their bills and their, their system. I know how to deal with that. And so I reversed it. I actually appointed him as trustee of my master trust and I expressed a individual trust for my IRS account. And I appointed him as a trustee. And even in a meeting that I went to with him in July, when I had, I convened our court as a court of evidentiary record and we recorded it and we took all the steps that, that I needed to do. And I appointed him as trustee. And during that conversation, he said to me, or he was recording it for his own record. He said something about the taxpayer. And I said, well, there's no taxpayer here. And then I corrected myself. Oh, I said, well, actually there is a taxpayer. You officer so-and-so are the taxpayer because you are the trustee and you hold the liability. And that was in July. And later in the year, I provided him the means to clear or to extinguish, to settle and close that liability. And he didn't perform on that. So I wrote to Treasury Criminal Investigation and I said, hey, he's the trustee and he's not settling this account. And so they called me up and asked me to come visit them, which I did about a, a month ago. And so I've turned it around to make him my trustee. He holds the liability. The exact same thing applies to a court, court officer, a public officer, you name it. Because everything that they're creating in terms of paper, traffic ticket, court case, IRS bill, you name it, is simply another event of monetizing the bankrupt franchise and creating more debt paper to circulate as currency. So the real key here is we're at a tipping point. We have the ability to be true, absolute anarchists, where we remove the overlay of this presumption of consent, this bonded surety relationship to this entire global monetized debt system, and to actually become a true stand man or woman standing with full capacity. And that full capacity gives us the ability to do what I've just described, direct the trustees. You take care of it, it's your liability. And so there's many things I've done over the last 25 years, but it took me 23 years to perfect my understanding of what was the estate? How did trust law come into play? How does equity come into play? How does martial law come into play? How is the emergency banking rules coming into play? All of that. And now we've got it structured and perfected. And we now can become not only the director of all of it, but we can ultimately become the bank because we no longer need to go to them to bind ourselves into their religious, quasi-religious, ecclesiastical construct and, and basically bind ourselves from cradle to grave to be the surety. That's the last thing we want to do. Like you said, do you want the liabilities or you want the equity? You want the equity. In our status correction, we claim and perfect the holding of the equity. And that's what we all want. And one of us can do it, a thousand of us can do it, millions of us can do it. Once more and more of us do it, then we have more capacity to start actually removing the overlay that, that we're all burdened under, whether we're an expat or living in California. Fascinating. Uh, are you aware of a person named Dean Clifford? Yes. Uh, I don't know much about him, but I've been contacted by him recently. I, I know his name and I, I know that he was doing some sort of, I, I'm new to all this stuff, so you have to forgive me a little bit, no, but I understood fine. it as, what's that? No, I said, that's fine <laughs> that you're yeah. new to it. That's, uh, yeah, no, all mean, this stuff is new to me. 
Go on. No, I was just going to say, I'm excited about your being new to it because <laughs> it's opening up a whole world that you didn't know existed and, and all of your your members or listeners or you're not members because you're an anarchist, but <laughs> your listeners and, and so <laughs> hey, forth. You can so. still have members. It just has to be voluntary. Okay. Uh, but, you're, uh, you're right. That's true. <laughs> Go ahead. About but the, being, reason, the reason that I'm... Uh, uh, well, I'll basically tell you what my feeling or thinking of this sort of line of thought was. And you've definitely given me, by far, the best description of uh, this process or this way of getting out of this system that I've heard yet. And I know there is other people out there. I know there's Dean Clifford was doing something similar, and maybe you can explain that to me. Uh, and I think he was doing something sort of called like sovereign man or sovereign citizen sort sovereign. of approach to things. Yeah. And he's actually now in jail and I just got an email from him and uh, it's actually from his brother. And uh, they're actually coming to an Arcapoco, uh, his brother and a bunch of people. And they're bringing a bunch of T-shirts about Dean Clifford and an Arcapoco. Mm -hmm. And they actually want to do a Skype live call with Dean in jail, uh, which is interesting. But I have to look into it. I don't know much about him. But uh, my question to you is, uh, is, since you do know who Dean Clifford is, was he trying to do something similar to you and he still ended up in jail or was he doing it wrong or tell me what, what you think happened there? Well, to be blunt, the ultimate answer is yes, he was doing it wrong. Okay. Let's go back to the original metaphor of seven or eight or ten jigsaw puzzles all mixed up. Every single piece must be in place. Or let's just say just one jigsaw puzzle. You ever do a jigsaw puzzle and you're missing 10 pieces, you know, your dog ate them or something like that. And, um, you know, it's not a complete picture or you try to shove a piece that doesn't fit into a hole. That's not the proper receptacle. The issue about hidden in plain sight and all of these fragments that individually make no sense is that unless you have the complete picture and how it all dovetails interrelates and is a complete picture, you don't have the whole thing and the system is designed and the parties, the public actors, the judges and so forth are trained to see where there's a flaw and that flaw gives them a jurisdictional attachment. Okay. It's called traversal. Traversal is, you know, you're from Canada. I'm sure you must have gone skiing. And if you're on the mountain, you traverse from one side to the other, right? Well, in law, you can be in one jurisdiction and just one little thing, one little acquiescence to an offer to contract by the judge traverses you back to the other side, to his jurisdiction where he controls it. The problem with Dean, and he's, he's, he's a great guy, I've never met him or talked to him, but I've seen his work. It's, it's very advanced, but he's missing pieces. And if you're missing all, some of the pieces, you don't have the whole picture, you are jurisdictionally attached to their jurisdiction where they can legally and technically pull you in, put you in jail and all of that. So now you've just opened it up for me to tell you and, and describe the most important piece that everybody misses. Okay. The, um, I've mentioned the year 1863. I've mentioned martial law, things like that. We are in martial law in the United States and through the United States corporation through the rest of the world. That martial law was implemented in the beginning of the Civil War. Then in 1863, Lincoln, um, uh, it's not right, we're chartered, contracted, uh, commission, that's the word. He commissioned one of his field officers to create a body of rules for military occupation of occupied enemy territory. That was called, his name was Franz Lieber, and that was called the Lieber Code. And that Lieber Code describes what a foreign military occupier must do under the rules of the United States to maintain proper military relationship to the civil body and the people of that conquered territory. Okay, so that was issued in 1863 and the war ended. Lincoln was shot. Um, the 14th Amendment was passed in 1868, and in 1867, something called the Reconstruction Acts were issued. 
Those created five military districts for the 10 Confederate states. Those states wanted to come back into the original organic constitutional union, which had been dissolved. Okay, the way it was dissolved is because Congress um, adjourned when the states walked out, the southern states. So Lincoln was killed because he destroyed the Union, but he wanted to put it back together. And of course, the Rothschilds who were in control were not going to let that happen. So he was taken out and the Reconstruction Acts established military districts for the 10 southern states. Those southern states never left the military districts, so they have always been under military occupation. Then when um, the 1933 bankruptcy was initiated and the um, Emergency Banking Relief Act was passed, that shifted the whole system into emergency war powers, mil full military occupation. That's why the Fed, Federal Reserve System has 10 districts. That's why the world is broken up in districts. They are all military districts. So we have to understand military occupation. Then from the Civil War period, you have two very important things that took place. 1899, there was a Hague Convention and a treaty issued. And it's, it's, that treaty defined the nature of war on land. And war on land has to do with when there's a war on land, because everything I've described is the law of the sea. So they have to bring the law of the sea onto the land, and they created a treaty that everybody agreed to, or signatories agreed to that. And the first part of that treaty defined the nature of a belligerent. And it defines a belligerent who is a people who take up arms against an invading force, okay? That's why you hear, you know, Iraqis or Syrians or Libyans who take up arms as belligerents. It's under this treaty, okay? Next, in 1907, you have another treaty issued that adopted the rules of the Liber Code, and it made it global or international law to which the United States is bound. And then in that uh, 1907 um, treaty, it states at Article 55 that the military occupier is bound by rules of usufruct. Have you ever heard that word? No. Okay. Usufruct is derived, uh, derived from two Latin words. Usus, which means to use, and fruct or fructose, which means the fruit. What that means is a usufruct is allowed to use the fruit of another's tree. Let me define that in military occupation terms. It means the military occupier is authorized under these international treaties to use the fruit of the occupied people, property, and territories under duties and rules of usufruct. So that means the United States as a foreign body, the, the corporation in Washington, D.C., became the military occupier, and by 1907 was under the rules of this international treaty structure that gave it full permission, full authority, to use the fruit of the occupied people, property, and territories for military necessity. Okay, so then in, um, well, before I go into that, the other part of the article that I quoted says that if everything is under civil, uh, civil, uh, um, the civil body is maintaining its peaceful relationship with the military occupier, meaning it's not a belligerent. It's not taking up arms against that military occupation. If it does, then the military occupier is bound by the duties of usufruct, and there are five of those. The first one is it must issue a receipt for everything taken from the occupied territory and people. The birth certificate is that receipt. So it takes all the people and property, puts it under each one of our birth certificates. That's the receipt. Secondly, it must issue inventory or take a proper inventory of all the property taken. 
That inventory is done by the bureaucratic administrative bodies that we know as governments. So now they've taken it under military necessity. They've issued us a receipt. They've given us an inventory which we can access in the system. So now they have the right of usufruct to use the fruit of our labor in order to maintain and uh, continue their military necessity. Thirdly, they must maintain the property in good condition. They must, uh, fourthly, they must pay all fees, taxes, maintenance, repairs, everything to maintain that property. And fifthly, they must return the property to the original owners in proper or improved condition upon the cessation of the military occupation. So what does that translate to? The United States became the military occupier first of the 10 Southern states through five military districts by the Reconstruction Acts. It then created a whole body of military function and occupation. The Federal Reserve Act is part of that. So the Federal Reserve note is nothing more than a mil private military script that we're given permission to use under military occupation. They're supposed to maintain everything, but here's the twist. They put, us, put the corporation into bankruptcy. They issued the Emergency Banking Relief Act, declared it a martial law occupation in effect. And from that point forward, any act that was done in the public, which means in commerce, under the rules of the Uniform Commercial Code, which control all securities, all monetary structure, all taxation, things like that, that anything done in the public in commerce is against the law, is illegal, and must be licensed. So that's why we have to get a license to operate in commerce. We have to get a business license, a doctor's license, a contractor's license. All of these are permissions to do something that is technically illegal. If you were to go to a law dictionary, look under the word license, it says permission to do something that's illegal. Okay. So then we get a driver's license and that gives us the ability to be a driver in commerce to operate our commercial franchise. Okay, getting that picture. But if we do anything against their military occupation, then we're considered an enemy of the state. We're considered a belligerent. That's why under the Patriot Act, now we have something called paper terrorism or domestic terrorism, because the whole public federal military occupation is called the domestic zone. And so if we do something against their military rules, which is the 60 to 80 million codes and statutes in the United States and millions in Canada and Mexico and everywhere else, then we are doing something that's technically causing harm to the public. We are considered a domestic terrorist. We are a belligerent and we are an enemy combatant. Okay. This is why every being, every man like Dean Clifford and all the rest of them who I've studied with have ended up in jail because they are still operating under the bonded surety franchise relationship that means that they must comply to all the rules of the military occupation. So commerce is a battlefield. We have to remove ourselves from commerce. That doesn't mean remove ourselves from from business or enterprise or, um, you know, capitalism. It just means we have to stop operating in their playing field because their playing field is a battlefield. And one more point, and then I'm going to turn it back to you. Go back to the 14th Amendment. In the 14th Amendment, it says that the, the public debt cannot be challenged. Well, wait, first of all, in, in section one, it says all persons born or naturalized within the United States and subject to the jurisdiction thereof are citizens of the United States. That's what defines a U.S. person. Then in section four, it says all the entire national de public debt cannot be challenged as to its validity, it means that as long as you're operating as a public person, a U.S. person, 
And remember, every nation on the planet is a U.S. person, okay? It is subject to U.S. law, and therefore every citizen in every nation is a U.S. person. They're just not acting on it yet. So if we're subject to their jurisdiction as the bonded surety through the bankrupt franchise, we cannot challenge the debt. We are bonded to it and we cannot challenge it. Secondly, that inviolable nature of that debt obligation extends to, and you can just go, just Google 14th Amendment and read it. You will see it right there. It says, including the obligations for pensions and bounty for services in the suppression of insurrection and rebellion. This is the key. See, I've seen that phrasing for 25 years. I read it and read it and I kept asking myself, why is that there? You know, it doesn't make sense until I understood the military occupation and everything else that we've talked about. It means that if you're still the bonded surety and you do something against their millions of codes and statutes, you are considered a belligerent because you're a paper terrorist under the Patriot Act and you are causing domestic terrorism and harm to the public. As such, you can be suppressed. That suppression can come in the form of a court case, a criminal charge, um, a tax bill. Everything you see happening in the United States and in the world is all based on this one construct, military occupation and a belligerent relationship to the military occupier. So the secret of being a true anarchist an anar anarcho-capitalist, if I could pronounce it right, is to disconnect our bondage to this whole system and move ourselves into the private under the, everything that we teach in Gemstone and Pantera Society and all the rest of it and become a true living man on the land, which we have the capacity to do. Fascinating stuff. Uh, really looking forward to seeing you at Anarchapoco. That's uh, there's going to be so many amazing people there that uh, it's just going to be so interesting to talk to you all in one place. And as I mentioned, I believe uh, Dean Clifford's brother and a bunch of his friends are coming to Anarchapoco, and we might even have Dean Clifford uh, Skype in. <coughs> uh, so Good. all kinds of uh, interesting and amazing stuff. Uh, so really looking forward to seeing you here, and I'm sure lots of other people will be very interested in talking to you and hearing more about how they can uh, potentially deslave themselves or, or remove themselves from the system that they uh, didn't know they were even a part of. I didn't even know I was, and uh, still a lot more for me to look into, but this is uh, very interesting. Glad to get this information so I can look into it for myself. Uh, so. Uh, Kenneth, why don't you just finish off, just let people know where they can find out more information about Pantera or Gemstone University or anything else, any videos you have or blogs or anything like that. Okay, great. Um, as you said, we'll be at, at, at the conference and we have a table as, as a sponsor. So we'll, we'll have a, a small contingent there. We look forward to everybody, everybody coming and talking to us. In the meantime, we have two websites uh, www on both of them. Pantera, which is spelled with two R's, P-A-N-T-E-R-R-A-P-C-A, -R -R which stands for Private Contract Association dot org. So Pantera PCA dot org and Gemstone, just like Ruby Sapphires, etc. Gemstone University dot org. And if you want to get ahead of the curve, you can join us. Um, it's a very simple process uh, on Gemstone. <clears throat> Uh, at the upper left, it says join now, become a member. We are only, all of the detail of the education is, is members only. We only operate in the private. So <clears throat> you can become a member, <coughs> excuse me, uh, <clears throat> before the conference and become familiar with a lot more depth of all this detail that we've covered. <clears throat> and, um, and, there you have it. And also we just launched a new YouTube channel under Gemstone University. <coughs> I'm losing my voice. So, <clears throat> so go there, we'll, we'll be loading some things over the next two weeks before the beginning of the conference on, on the YouTube channel. And, and there's quite a bit also on the public side of the Gemstone site. On the Pantera site is our entire body of public notice. Uh, our letters to the world bodies, to the Holy See, um, 
lots of very interesting things of our public notices establishing our right to exist as a private society and in a superior jurisdiction, as I mentioned before. So there's a lot of reading on both, both sites in the further details if you become a member. So I, I look forward to seeing you, Jeff, down there and everybody else. And it's going to be a lot of fun and quite interesting. So thanks a lot, Jeff. Yeah, thank you, Kenneth. So check out all the stuff. We'll have the links all down below. If you like this video, please like, subscribe, <laughs> share. Uh, this video will probably just be going up just before Anarchapoco happens. Uh, but if you're watching it and it's still a few days away, uh, check out flights. There's a lot of super cheap flights thanks to uh, the uh, lower uh, uh, price of oil, uh, the really bad economy, and now the Ebola two 2016, as I call it, Zika. It's the new thing to scare everybody <laughs> into not traveling. Uh, so there's a lot of cheap flights. So a lot of great people are going to be there like Kenneth and so many others. It's really going to be just an amazing week. I'm really looking forward to it. I'm trying to prepare for it now. Uh, so check out all that stuff and uh, really looking forward to seeing you, Kenneth, and getting more into this stuff. This is the first time I've really, you know, we've had over 240 episodes now and we've never talked about this angle of things. And uh, so this is the first time. So I'll be looking into it a lot more and uh, maybe we'll have you on again or talk more about this in the future. Uh, so that's it for Anarchast, your home for anarchy on the internet. Peace, love, and anarchy. See ya. Thanks. In case you find these videos useful, please share them with others so we can help them too. Subscribe and hit the bell icon for more videos and updates. Thank you very much for watching. See you next time. Peace.